Thank you for the opportunity to be here, but most importantly, thanks to all of you for caring so much about the climate, because I know that's the only reason that you're all here. Let me tell you a little bit about Lancetec, but before I do, I think we all need to re-remember why we're here, right? I don't think any of us needed to read the IPCC report to, to really understand the situation. And if you, uh, read, if you did read it, like I did, you cried because you can see that one and a half degrees and two degrees are really just a dream at this point. The reality is we are at 1.1 degree right now, and yet Pakistan, 30% was underwater last year. We reached temperatures in India that were just a few percent humidity away from a wet bulb temperature that could have killed entire cities. And of course, California is literally washing into the ocean. This has to change. And what we do at Lancetec is we take this problem, this carbon pollution, and we convert it to the products that we use every single day. And the way we do this is with a bacteria. We turn to the bacteria that are at Lancetec we call our great, great, great grandfather. This was a bacteria that lived on Earth openly when there was no air to breathe that was rich in oxygen, when we could not live here, when the planet was filled with toxic gases. This bacteria thrived. In fact, today it's rhesus, and you can still find it, but it's hiding in hydrothermal vents or other places where it hides from the beautiful air and atmosphere that we've created for ourselves. But we figure if we're going to repair, then we need to go back and use things that used to thrive in that atmosphere so that we could take all manner of pollution from industrial gases, waste, to solid waste like trash that ends up in our ocean, and we could convert that to all the products we use every day. This is not science fiction. That Zara dress was a collection that was sold a Christmas ago, and you could easily buy it on the internet. And the polyester in that dress was pollution from China, from one of our plants. It was going to go into the atmosphere. Here are the pictures of the plants. These are three commercially operating plants. The first one started up in 2018. It makes 50,000 tons of ethanol, starting from a carbon monoxide gas that was going to be turned into carbon dioxide and particulates. Let's never forget that when we burn carbon, we don't just make carbon dioxide, we also make particulates that make it difficult to breathe that air. And that plant's been running since 2018. We've built two more. One is running at a ferroalloy mill, started in 2021, and the other one started in 2022, also at a ferroalloy mill in China. Our first plant in India has just started up. It uses a gas from a refinery, not a steel or ferroalloy plant. It uses hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide. 50% of the carbon comes from carbon dioxide. Uh, the, in addition, we are starting another plant in China and a plant in Europe with ArcelorMittal, the largest steel company in the West. So we will have an additional three by the end of the year, not science fiction. <laughs> This is truly industrial biotechnology. These are not bacteria that are lab prima donnas. These are actually bacteria that can live in the toxic environments of a steel mill gas. And essentially what we do, we plug a brewery. This is just like making beer, except you use gases instead of sugar. And we plug that into an industrial facility. It looks a lot like a refining unit operation because that's exactly what it is. It is a process technology that refines carbon waste to ethanol. How does it work? Um, we have developed this bacteria. We've optimized this bacteria, and we've developed the whole process around it. This bacteria eats these gases in a special bioreactor that's continuous. 
So you know when you do fermentation, like in making beer, you put the yeast and the sugar and you go away, come back three months later. This is not like that. This actually is continuous, gas in, product out. And we've optimized the whole process because we don't just care about carbon, we care about water. So we recycle our water, et cetera, to make the cost sensible. Where do these gases come from? Industrial gases. We can also take waste, solid waste, and gasify it, turn it into a gas, a partial combustion, and we can feed that into the reactor, makes the same product. And as hydrogen, green hydrogen becomes available, we can convert CO2. I always tell people, if you give me green hydrogen, I can refine carbon dioxide and make every product you will ever need. So what are we doing with that ethanol? If we can use all these waste resources, that's way more ethanol than the world needs, especially as we transition away from using ethanol as a blend component for gasoline. But we take that ethanol and we make jet fuel. We take that ethanol and we convert it to polyester. We've converted it to detergents. And of course, we can put it all back in the cycle because we can use all of these gases. This is basically the circular economy at work. These are all the types of products we've made. All of these things have started life at a gas that was going to be pollution and have been converted into these products. It is not science fiction. These products are real. We've made them at commercial scale. And just so we don't miss the point, <laughs> this is actually part of the MOVE collection from H&M. And as you can tell, the polyester was made with our ethanol. This was sold on their internet site uh, just a few weeks ago. So we're really excited to be able to do this. I told you we had done sustainable aviation fuel as well. In this case, we had to develop the technology to make sustainable aviation fuel, and we did that with Pacific Northwest National Lab. When we did that, you know, the world uses 100 billion gallons of aviation fuel. Today, there's about 20 million being produced commercially. The gap is massive. Corsia says we have to get to 10 billion by the end of this decade, seven years from now, not a lot of time. And so what we decided to do is instead of holding it tight inside Lance Attack, that we would actually spin out a company and capitalize it separately so we can build a 10 million gallon a year plant and get it up and running faster. That plant will be up and running later this year. And so I always say if you love something, let it go. And we did. <laughs> and so it's on its own and it's working well. We have gone after massive markets. These are combined about a trillion dollar markets. And the reason that matters is because we want to go after the high value commodity, chem I'm sorry, low value commodity chemicals. Most people that do fermentation want to go after high value, but we want to stop gigatons of carbon from going in the atmosphere. And you don't do gigatons of carbon unless you start to displace our current carbon economy. So if you stop and think about it for a second, 30% of, of a barrel of petroleum ends up in the stuff we use every day. I know everybody thinks about fuel and power, but 30% is used to make the chair you sit on and the shoes you wear. And so and ethylene is the largest chemical of that. And so what we've done is we've gone ahead and gone after ethylene. If you make ethanol, you can make ethylene, the largest commodity chemical. And what we've also done is we've learned how to make ethylene from the gases directly, so we don't have to stop at ethanol. Now, this is still science fiction. We've done it in the lab, but we intend to commercialize it very soon. Our ethanol microbe naturally evolved, but we're making other important chemicals through Direct not direct evolution, by genetic modification. And these are, again, massive commodity chemicals. We work at the interface of biology and engineering. Everything is programmed and modeled all the way to scale. We're building plants all over the world. Pollution is everywhere. We want to be everywhere. Think of us as the Roy Kent. <laughs> he's there, he's here, he's there, he's blipping everywhere. Um, 
And I would also, if, can I take a few more seconds? Um, I also want to point out it took us 18 years to get to this point. As you know, when you build, go from discovery to first commercial process facilities, it's a long journey. We call it crossing the valley of death. And after you build your first one, you have to diffuse like solar did, so you are truly everywhere. And that is the Grand Canyon of death. And what we've done is we've partnered with Brookfield, who's committed up to a billion dollars to help us build facilities faster. So we're really excited about creating this circular economy. I leave you with a simple thought. I leave you where we started. We have a massive problem. We have to reduce our carbon by 50%. That means we have to change our entire carbon economy. We are not going to incrementalize ourselves out of this. I just showed you we can do it. There are others who can do it. I welcome you to the revolution. Let's create that carbon economy of the future. Thank you.